<laughs> there might be one or two. Right, okay. If I could start with uh, the woman at the very back, right in the middle there. Okay, hi. Um, if you could say who you are. My name is Melanie Strickland, I'm a solicitor, um, fairly recent Green Party member. Um, I'm interested in the Green Party as the party of hope and the party of radical change. And I think the most exciting political force recently has been the Occupy movement. And they've been exciting because they're telling the truth and asking fundamental questions about our society, like capitalism. Is it a good thing? Corporate personhood has become too powerful and we need a mechanism to revoke it. And is, is corporate personhood a good idea, full stop? So I want to know what the, what the candidates' <coughs> views are about Occupy and how radical they, they see themselves. Okay, thank you very much. If, Keep your hands up. Let's get right. um, just put it aside. Uh, so, oh, uh, Shara Ali, Red Green Party, also London Pen Officer. Just, I wanted to first say what a fantastic set of candidates with impassioned, articulate speeches. Uh, very difficult to decide a first preference. I wanted to ask whether you could recount some episode, maybe from recent history in your life, you know, either within politics or without it, outside of it, where you may have stepped up to the plate, risked harm or reputational damage or loss to yourself. Um, in order to fight for some principle and think of uh, an episode of non-binder action, for example, which you may have faced imprisonment. Whether there's anything like that in your in your recent past that you could recount for us, please. Thanks. And uh, the guy in the middle with white headphones. Uh, yeah. So recently we've caught quite a bit of flack regarding science policies. I wanted to see what the leaders thought about how we can place science at the heart of the party and when we can actually fight the mainstream and actually point out when science is wrong as well. Okay, we'll take uh, we'll take those those three questions <coughs> on uh, Occupy, on putting it off <coughs> on the line, and on science. And uh, we'll start with the main. Oh, thanks very much. That's, all right. well, that's the little <laughs> random <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, stepping up to the plate, I suppose I broke twice through police lines. Once when I was kettled at the uh, G20, and then I think it was on the second, but it could have been the third student demonstration where uh, we were trapped behind um, two rows of horses. Some of you would have been with me there and we wanted to get round and back to uh, film or take some photographs of Caroline Lucas who was uh, speaking to us uh, from the top of an open uh, deck at the bus there. Uh, I do remember going back a long time, I think I was 17 or 18, I was having a pint of beer in a pub, uh, we heard a bang. I was the only person who ran out of the pub to see what had happened. Um, and there was a gunshot victim on the road who I stayed with and talked to. I made him hold his own wound closed, I must admit, and I was thinking, <laughs> what have you done to deserve that? I don't know, but you may be innocent, so I'll sit with you and keep you conscious till the ambulance arrives. Um, yeah, Occupy movement, I think, w was absolutely fantastic and I know that there's, it was so easy for our media to just pull it apart saying oh they don't know what they want, they just know what they're against and absolutely uh, entrenched in their own way of analysing um, uh, politics and in keeping the establishment and the status quo it was impossible for them to see what it really represented but also underneath that the very fact that nobody would claim to be a, an official spokesperson for anyone in the movement. I don't know if any of you realise, but that was part, comes really from our philosophical basis. Part of the reason, you know, I read the whole of the, uh, as it was, uh, Manifesto for a Sustainable Society before I, I joined, having found you very late in life. But the philosophical basis in there, which was that it's not all about electoral politics. Now, I believe, because I've joined, because I've you know, worked to be elected and held elected office, that electoral means that when we have the radical change that is absolutely necessary for us for our future, that there is some structure, that there's not chaos, and we don't want to go back to you know, say, saying how bad things could be if there isn't some sort of electoral structure there for us to make a transition to a better future. But Occupy Movement has brought out many of what should be, to intelligent people, the most obvious issues. I think it was Rudolf Rocker who said that often people do not realise how oppressed they are 
or that they're agents of oppression until some social movement comes along and changes things and then suddenly they realise. So I want us, we have to push all the way, we are running out of time. And I guess the others. <laughs> good science, we've got to be good scientists. All right, okay. Um, I was so jealous of the Occupy movement. I wanted it to be us. I loved it. I live in Wales. I came up a couple of times and talked to folk and hung around, tried to work out <coughs> what was going on. I also um, developed uh, a dialogue with some ecumenical organisations who have taken this much more deeply than you would imagine. Um, not just Churchy, Church of England, but the Muslims and the, the Islamic uh, positioning as well, and some of the groups that include both of those. And so I've started a dialogue with them as well, because the Occupy movement, for me, was what we should have done. We Greens should have said, we knew this was wrong, we know it's wrong, and we should be out there with you. And so I lent my support, and a lot of people from Wales did as well. We, some people tried an Occupy movement in Cardiff, but it was ineffective because you know, Wales has its different issues. The Bank of England, you know, the whole damn you know, fiasco is happening here in London. It was the right thing to do, and I'm still behind it all the way. Um, risking my reputation, <laughs> when you can find it on YouTube, <laughs> um, I was travelling to the West Bank um, a year ago, almost exactly, and uh, uh, with a group of people to visit some Palestinian civil society organisations. And... We, um, for some reason, got split up. I ended up being the only person out of a group of about 30 from Europe who was allowed through the airport, possibly because I looked like me and they didn't think I looked like a terrorist. <laughs> How wrong can you be? <laughs> so, anyway, I got through, nobody else did, I waited. I finally got a text and the text said, Pippa, get help, we're being attacked. Okay, there's me. All right, on the other side of the airport, and everybody else back there, a text saying we've been attacked. I was halfway through my meal. Um, so I abandoned that. I tried to rally some people in Ben Gurion Airport to no effect because everybody who was there was in the police or plain closed or the army or something else. So finally, I found an uh, Israeli network television camera. I accosted it. And the man was trying, you know, the anchor man was giving his six o'clock news spiel, and I was like saying, Well, I got a message from my friends. To no avail, so I thought, damn it, I'm going to have to do this on my own. Now, I could have had a wonderful week in Bethlehem, or I could go and try and help these guys. So, with my trusty wheelie suitcase, I marched up to the doors of Ben Gurion Airport, that's where you come out. Um, there was one man standing there on his own, going, Whoa, 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 and I just picked up my suitcase and I bang the doors until they open and you can find this and uh, when I went through the doors the cameras followed me from Israeli Network TV um, cameras followed me and then the um, uh, police and security asked the journalists to go away and uh, I was then beaten up so I'm not afraid to put my money where my mouth is I was handcuffed I was in jail in uh, Givon jail for five days, the British consulate was no help at all. Sorry, I was just going to get to the end of the story, and that, and that, that continues. Uh, oh gosh, academics, scientists, speak out. We need our academics to speak out and not sit in their ivory towers. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to start with science since it's got a bit short shift up to now. Um, I think the Green Party has more solidly evidence-based policy than any other political party. And I think any unbiased observer looking at our policy would agree with that. In terms of food and agriculture, our science policies, we've done a huge amount of work. And if you look at two particular areas, very controversial areas, which is both policy on, dr on uh, drugs, illicit drugs, and policy on sex work, we have very strongly evidence-based policies which incidentally are actually the policies that the general public, when you do surveys on, agree with, and they're policies that the science agrees with. But what we have to do is make sure, and I think we've done this with our policy in recent years, <coughs> is we distinguish between when we've looked at the scientific evidence and made a judgment and says that should be the policy. And sometimes we look at the way the world is and say, this isn't the way the world is, we politically believe we need to change it. So we need to make sure we're always clear whether we're saying the scientific evidence says we should do this based on how things are, 
or saying we believe there are some things we just shouldn't do, we need to change or do differently. And I think we, we save ourselves a lot of grief and make a lot of sense when we split those two things up. Um, in terms of Melanie and Shara's question, um, I'm going to actually combine those two because I was actually at Occupy on the first day of Occupy. Um, and it was actually that morning it had been a training session for London Assembly candidates. Uh, and I got a phone call uh, from my partner Jim who was at that stage semi-kettled and said, hey, this looks great, come over. So I did. And so I, <laughs> so I, wasn't, I wasn't dressed, you know, if you're going to go and get kettled, you know, the, all of us who've been around these kind of things know you go prepared, you take supplies, you've got the right clothes and the right shoes and all those sorts of things. I just went, oh hell, and just went in anyway. And spent most of the afternoon being possibly kettled or possibly not kettled. It was really quite hard to tell. But I was there for most of the afternoon and it was a very exciting um, afternoon. But what I also did on this, that afternoon, and you can find, and this is where I get really to, to Melanie's question, uh, you can find the video I made that afternoon, which was a video about what I think is one of our most exciting policies. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I was the move person who moved to the conference, uh, which is the abolition of the Corporation of the City of London. Uh, now, Jenny and Darren very kindly seconded that motion when I took it to conference. And what that means, it's only symbolic, it wouldn't change everything. But if we say the Corporation of the City of London that says on its own website it exists to support the financial industries, globalisation and liberalisation around the world, that has billions of pounds in funds, owns land all around the world and has a, per a representative <coughs> of the City of London that's the only person who's not an MP who's allowed on the floor of the House of Commons. He's called the Remembrancer. He is there whispering in MPs' ears as they're about to vote, as they're debating, and even more importantly, he, and I say he because it has always been a he, is looking at all legislation that's being drawn up. The financial industries are there at the heart, the globalising, liberalising, they're at the heart of our government. We have to get them out. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just go back to the Lib Dem one, uh, just really to say that uh, the Lib Dems are struggling in particular areas, particularly in the north. We've seen that collapse happen in Liverpool and Manchester. In Manchester, they were trying to defend 15 council seats last year, they lost all 15. They tried to defend 14 this year, they lost all 14. That's how it's been in a lot of the urban areas up north. There is an opportunity there. That vote at local elections going to Labour by default because they're seen as the most credible alternative. But that's changing as well. In Manchester, we've got four second places. In Liverpool, we've got six second places. So, it, you know, we can be the alternative. <coughs> Science policies. We absolutely have to be rigorous. We have to be seen to be rigorous because it's this common perception. Oh, it's the Greens. We'll interview them. We'll, we'll throw them a... a like an odd question to start with. So when I was interviewed on the Northwest Politics Show, they allowed me to do my preamble, why I'm a standing the leader of the Green Party. And then the first question they asked me is, you want to legalise all drugs, don't you? So you, you will have this deliberately thrown at you to discredit you, to make you a bit of a joke party. And it's really important that we come back every time and say, no, actually our policies are stronger, have better evidence base than the other parties. And that's really crucial. In terms of putting yourself on the line, in um, 2009 I stood as a lead, can lead candidate for us in the North West. I ran a campaign which was anti-racist. We put on the ballot paper, say no to racism. We had uh, part of the campaign was a viral section which was stop Nick Griffin, look for the best tactical vote to stop Nick Griffin. Again, accurately proved um, when the election came. And the organiser of the BNP in Liverpool was a guy called Joey Owens. Now, Joey Owens was on trial for murder. And Joey, yeah, uh, sorry, it was a bit of a tag at moment there. Um, uh, but Joey, Joey Owens was on trial for murder, and the reason he didn't um, get sentenced is a key, ev key witness withdrew evidence during the trial. And so this was the guy that's organising the BNP, and during that election campaign, I'm getting stuff through my door. Nothing overtly threatening, but it's from the BNP, it's calling me names, and it's basically saying, we know where you live. And so I'm running that campaign, I've got my wife, I've got my six-month-old son at home during that campaign. And that's hard. And that's hard to go out sometimes at six in the morning and come back at midnight and know that you're leaving your family there by themselves. That's a hard thing to do. And on the actual night of the election, I moved my family out 
expecting the worst if we beat the BNP. Now, we didn't, but we will next time, and it's, I, I'm willing to put me on the line. But more frighteningly, my family get put in the firing line, and that's the real worry thing for me. And finally, on the Occupy movement, we've had good communication with them in Liverpool, so that's between our council group and the Occupy movement. We've done what we can to support them in terms of legal advice, if they've been saying, right, well, what rights do we have here if we're in, in this building, and if we're going to move here, could we ask you about this? So we've tried our best to support it. But to me, it's an awakening. It's, you know, we, we are now awakening to the crisis that we're facing. And I think Occupy are leading that and actually are leading voice in it. We just need that 18 to 24 age group, that 18 to 30 age group, to be supporting us politically as well as a direct action. Thank you. Sir. We're halfway through. Thank you very much uh, to the candidates, to all of you, for bearing with the heat. It's uh, not the best ventilator in the world, so uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll go for another round of questions, though. Um,